Hello, my name is Alan Foom, and today I'm going to talk about net to gross ratio, uh, an important factor within uh, estimating volumes of hydrocarbons within the oil and gas field. So, what is net to gross? So, net to gross is a portion of your rock which is reservoir, which is which is capable both of holding hydrocarbons and producing hydrocarbons. So, you define that using cutoffs for sedimentology and uh, porosity, petrophysics, and, uh, and saturation. So you're trying to exclude the non-reservoir rock. So this is your volumetric equation. That's your gross rock volume times the net to gross, which we're going to talk about today, times the porosity, which I have a video on, times the saturation, times the formation volume factor. And the recoverable volume is hydrocarbon place times the recovery factor. And I have also have a video on recovery factors within my channel. So how do you define net to gross? What is it? And why is it so important? So Let's talk about reservoir and non-reservoir rock. So let's talk about reservoir rock first. Here we are in a sand system. That I know that we also have limestone system, the same sort of scenario applies. You have porous rock within here, so sandstone with pores. Then you have the non-reservoir rock. So you have shale, you have mud rocks, uh, clay stones. These would uh, basically not be capable of holding hydrocarbons in producible form. And then you have tight, low porosity sandstone, uh, potential limestone stringers within your sand system which have extremely low porosity, virtually no permeability, will not flow anything out in uh, production time, but may communicate with between different porous units. Now, so your aim is to eliminate this lot. A little bit about uh, geometry and philosophy. So you have tanks versus pancakes. So a tank is this system here. So you have effectively a, a system of sand bodies within a a big shell container so you have channels you have sheet floods you have barrier bars and these all communicate within each, each, each other so these could be either hundreds of meters thick and you tend to use this as prospect level and again you choose their net to gross separate reservoir units and then non-reservoir for the volumetric calculation alternatively you can go the discrete system so you can have a, for example a turbidite fan a sheet flood a channel and you're trying to map these things individually this is obviously has some difficulty, some uncertainty. You need to understand the geology more. And these units are relatively thin. They're tens of meters uh, thick at most. These tend to be virtually all net, where this has quite a lot of non-net. This is uh, more popular in, in American geology, uh, whereas this is more popular in European geology for various cultural reasons and uh, sedimentological reasons basically if you go if you're looking at the brent system in north sea you tend to go this direction if you're looking at individual uh, sandstones in the gulf of mexico you tend to go in this direction but net to gross also has a big impact on recovery so you can imagine this system here high net to gross system got high connectivity should have good sweep efficiency suitable for water floods this system here more of a labyrinth lower connectivity likely to have uh, poorer sweep may not be suitable for enhanced recovery may not be suitable for water flood my own experience i was working in a sister on, a, on an oil field which had uh, one high net to gross unit basically a channel which is full of sand and flanking it were these uh, thin thin channels sheet floods etc in a labyrinth system this worked really well in terms of the water flood this one not so much and again, designing your reservoir layering is pretty important. So you try to split your ro uh, your rock volume into layers which have roughly similar properties, some lateral and vertical continuity. So you would do a correlation, for example, here. So these sand bodies, you would look at your um, log signature. You look at biomarkers, so fossil markers. In terms of biostratigraphy, you look at chemical markers, chemostratigraphy, you look at pressure data, what communicates with what. Obviously, you need to have quite a few wells to do that. Uh, and you look at sequence geography. So if this is an example of a set of logs with a, a log with uh, sequences. So you would have uh, your maximum flood, your sequence boundaries, your maximum flooding surfaces. You mark all of this on, and you try to figure out what's going on. Uh, so this is what a sedimentologist uh, does for you. So a little bit about a few definitions. So first of all, you have your uh, V-shale cutoff, your porosity cutoff, and your saturation cutoff. This is a CPI. CPI is computer process interpretation. This is what a petrophysicist uses to communicate with you. Yes, they do communicate. They are lovely people, honest. So it's a display which contains both measured logs, gamma ray, neutron resistivity, etc., and interpreted rocks. For example, V shale, volume of shale. So in this uh, picture here, that's the green uh, green material. Uh, the yellow material is the sand. The red material is the hydrocarbon. And the white material is the water. And this can be quite a clear 
way of getting your message across as a petrophysicist. And the blue bars here are the net. So that's your net pay that you use for calculation because it goes above uh, all the cutoffs. This is from a lecture by Peter Finch, um, a public lecture which is available uh, on, uh, on the internet. So you have your V-shale cutoff. Now V-shale is the volume of shale. So in this particular case, you have quite a discrete sand volume and a discrete shell volume. And this is your cutoff and everything above the cutoff uh, is, uh, is, is sand, is reservoir, everything below is, is uh, non-reservoir. And there are various ways of doing your V-shale cutoff. They're basically based on gamma ray logs. Gamma ray logs respond to uh, uranium, potassium, and thorium uh, minerals within shale, which tend to be higher than they are in non-shale rocks. So it's a shale indicator, the various formulas to get your V-shale percentage, because there's uh, going to be some clay minerals within sandstones, particularly something like the full mine and central North sea, Jurassic beach sandstone. And also you have your neutron density uh, crossovers, which you will use to do that. So this is a diagram from GeoOil. And the different uh, formulas that will give you slightly different react results. And again, you try to make your V-shale cut from that, or your petrophysicist does for you. You have your reservoir cutoff. Everything has to be above a certain porosity value. Again, this is from Peter Finch. Again, here you have nice binary distribution. It's fairly easy where you put it. Um, in some cases, it's not quite so com uh, um, comprehensive as that. So again, you have your cross plot here, and you would try to make your cutoff within that. Now, porosity cutoffs can be a bit controversial. Uh, so some rock is unlikely to have sufficient volume contained so, um, and may have difficulty flowing. Again. Do you include marginal rock by reducing average porosity? Do you exclude marginal rock? Again, conversation to be had, and it's quite a bit of uh, discussion that's there. Then you have your uh, reservoir cutoff, where you're trying to cut off your lower saturation pay um, and your lower saturation units. And again, everything above a, a certain uh, hydrocarbon saturation gets in, everything below gets, uh, gets cut off. Again, here, binary system, that's fairly easy. In reality, sometimes it may be a lot more complicated than that. And putting it all together, so you have your V-shell volume, so everything above the line. Then you have your porosity cutoff, everything above the line. And then you have a saturation cutoff, and there you put your, your net sand, your net reservoir, and then your net pay. Using net to gross and volumetric estimation, again, you need to have consistencies with your geological model, looking at the layering scheme, what are the properties of different layers. So, for example, here you have a high porosity high net to gross layer and slightly lower porosity lower net to gross layer and you treat those two layers as separate units or you have a channel and you have an overbank system again you treat those two as different units um, tanks versus pancakes again you need to try to make a model which represents what you think geology is doing and having a suitably wide range so here's some examples so a low net to gross system 25 low 35 mid 50 percent high mm, okay maybe you might want to go for discrete units if you know where they are Mid net to gross system 35, 50, 70, high net to gross system 50, 65, 80. Obviously, if you're looking at discrete units, you're looking at 80 plus, but you need to know where discrete units are. So again, trying to make something that's consistent with the geological model, consistent with, uh, with the uncertainties that you face. Sum up, net to gross is a controversial subject among some geologists. Some geologists just don't like it. They just want to map net, net units, which, you know, is a fair and reasonable point of view. But you need to eliminate non-reservoir rock from the volumetric estimates, different ways of doing that, tanks versus pancakes. Depending on your cutoffs, will your marginal rock attribute? What are your cutoffs for V-shale and porosity? That can be subjective. And net to gross can be mapped for each layer and each reservoir model. So again, try to make sensible decisions to get to a good conclusion. So thank you very much. Please like, please subscribe, and I'll see you on the next one.